this presentation is uh, for IARPIC. It, it's a, a pleasure and an honor to contribute to discussions relating to environmental intelligence. Um, this particular uh, recording is the day after the IARPIC discussion, which I learned a great deal from the data modeling and observing sub-teams. Um, so I will mix those comments into my presentation uh, having learned yesterday and uh, intention is to be helpful. Uh, I was invited to share information about the Panarctic Options Project, uh, which uh, has the subtext of holistic integration for Arctic coastal marine sustainability. Um, before presenting uh, details that are relevant to the discussion about environmental intelligence, I think it's important to take a, a global perspective of the issues at hand. Um, so if we look at the earth on a planetary scale, um, about 30% of the earth falls within the boundaries of nations. And that 30% collectively uh, can be defined in terms of national interests. Um, historically, the, our civilization has evolved uh, in relation to national interests across that 30% of the earth. After World War II, uh, regions were set aside that were beyond sovereign jurisdictions uh, that account for the other 70% of the earth. So the full earth, um, in effect, was under some level of management uh, after following World War II. The first international space was uh, the high seas, explicitly beyond sovereign jurisdictions in 1958. Uh, the second one was the Antarctic, under the Antarctic Treaty in 1959. Um, it's worth noting that the Antarctic Treaty specifically identified common interests, um, both to promote cooperation and prevent conflict. Um, and it was based on science uh, that emerged during the International Geophysical Year in 1957. So 59 was immediately afterward. The Antarctic Treaty was also a a solution between the United States and Soviet Union uh, in terms of uh, what was then emerging as the uh, space race as well as uh, development of ballistic missiles. And the Antarctic Treaty became the first nuclear arms agreement in the world. 1967, Treaty on Outer Space Moon Celestial Bodies evolved, again beyond sovereign jurisdictions, 1971. Uh, the Treaty on the Deep Sea in terms of emplacement of nuclear weapons on, on the seafloor beyond continental shelf areas. Um, so in effect, if we look at the Earth, the challenge we collectively face as a civilization is one of balancing national interests and common interests. And in that sense, a primary role of science is to, is to help build common interests. So before it's possible to balance national interests and common interests. It's first necessary to build common interests. Uh, the Arctic Options Project or Pan-Arctic Options Project is preceded um, by the Arctic Options Project. Both of these um, are funded with National Science Foundation support um, as well as internationally. The Arctic Options Project started in 2013 with support from the United States and France. And then in 2015, under the Belmont Forum, the United States, Russia, Norway, France, China, and Canada became part of the Pan-Arctic Options Projects. And these two projects span the period from 2013 to 2020. Uh, conceptual scope of both projects is decision support to integrate stakeholder perspectives, geospatial data, and policy documents to reveal options that contribute to informed decision making for sustainable infrastructure development in the Arctic Ocean. And um, that was explicit in both of the proposals for these projects. Uh, in terms of de definitions, the word options uh, is without advocacy, uh, is explicitly can be used or ignored. And I, I say that uh, with full intent in this presentation as well, recognizing that IARPIC involves uh, federal agencies in the United States. And so certainly it is important for me only to introduce options and not make recommendations that involve ad agendas or, or advocacy. So the intention here is to contribute to informed decision making without being uh, compromised in a political discussion, which emerges in a sense when there are two or more agendas in play. So in a sense, part of the uh, 
dialogue and to remove the agendas. Um, the geographic scope of these two projects involves the Arctic region, uh, different areas within the Arctic Options Project and Pan Arctic, uh, plus the Bering Strait region uh, for the Pan Arctic Options Project. The types of in infrastructure options really relates to the types of decisions that can be made. Uh, one type of decision that can be made, it relates to governance options, regulatory devices, policy statements, treaties, conventions, various types of agreements. The other type of option in terms of decision making relates to things that can be built, um, mobile assets, fixed assets, ports, ships, uh, as well as any other system that effectively requires capitalization plus technology. So this would include communication systems, research systems, observing systems such as SEON, as well as information systems. Um, and uh, truly the, 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 the scope of these types of approaches intended to be holistic um, and the definition of holistic is used in these projects as being international, interdisciplinary, and inclusive, explicitly. Um, of these three elements, uh, inclusion is by far the biggest challenge. Um, it ranges in terms of the challenge in terms of data to be collected, organized, interpreted. It ranges in terms of the types of stakeholders to be included in the discussions. So uh, for the purposes of dialogue, the concept of holistic is taken to be international, interdisciplinary, and inclusive. And sustainability um, is, is identified in terms of balance, balance between environmental protection, economic prosperity, and societal well-being, but also balance in terms of urgencies of the present and the needs of the future, as well as balance between national interests and common interests in a manner that promotes cooperation and prevents conflict. Uh, the website for Pan-Arctic Options Project uh, is uh, www.panarcticoptions.org. Um, the component of both of these projects explicitly relates to science diplomacy. Uh, science diplomacy was defined in 2009 after the Antarctic Treaty Summit in Washington on the 50th anniversary of the Antarctic Treaty as being an international, interdisciplinary, and inclusive, which then became holistic. Uh, process to balance national interests and common interests for the benefit of all on Earth. Um, science diplomacy was explicitly identified as a process, recognizing that the circumstances in the world are constantly changing and that no magic solution exists, no single silver bullet um, to solve these problems. In effect, the, the solutions have to operate across time under changing circumstances, and such solutions effectively our process. And so since, since 2009, uh, the journey that I've been on has been to largely understand and define what that process looks like. Not that it's some, a new process, it's, it's a well-used, well-worn process, um, but to identify how it operates as simply as possible. And a component of the, the simplicity is to, is to effectively look at it in terms of scalability, that it that the process, if it's a real process, should be scalable from local scale, potentially even down to the family level, all the way to the international. Um, in this process, one of the, one of, again, thinking in terms of definitions, because often terms are used without definition, um, and having definition enhances the capacity to use the terms uh, in effective ways. And so one of the terms that's used in, in frequently is the concept of evidence. And then another term that's frequently used is the term data. Um, and I would note that data and evidence are not the same. Um, data effectively arises from questions. So in the framework of natural sciences, we hypothesize um, and then we go out and we collect the data to address the hypothesis, trying to uh, falsify the hypothesis as best we can with various experiments. The data um, effectively before they became data were sets of observations or pieces of information, but they weren't connected. And the connections between those observations effectively emerges with the questions. And so the concept of this inquiry pyramid starts out with a question that ultimately is the most important element. That's where the creativity and the training and, and sense of purpose comes from in terms of the questions. 
the data that's generated is used to answer the questions. With the, with the data, it's then possible to think in terms of evidence. And evidence explicitly implies four decisions. So it's evidence for a decision. The two types of evidence, as I mentioned earlier, that relate are evidence for built elements, mobile fixed assets, et cetera, or evidence for governance mechanisms. Um, with evidence and in considering the, the types of information that relate to decisions, uh, it's possible to create options. So the evidence, in a sense, isn't just used immediately for the purposes of decision making. The evidence frames the types of options that are available to the decision makers. And as I mentioned earlier, the options are without advocacy. They are explicitly there to be used or ignored by the decision makers, recognizing that the remit of the decision makers is to make decisions that internally within their systems, they can make recommendations, but from outside of those systems, the best we can contribute are options so that we're not seen as interfering in the decision-making process, whatever it happens to be within an industry, within government, whatever the government jurisdictional scale is. In terms of the decision support process itself, so the notion of science diplomacy was defined as a process, an international, interdisciplinary, and inclusive process. Uh, in terms of that process and how it operates, there are effectively three different reservoirs of information. One reservoir of information relates to stakeholder perspectives. Um, and again, these are international, interdisciplinary, and inclusive. So these stakeholder perspectives on one hand, involve rights holders, those that have the rights to define the operation of the system, the decision-making activity. Uh, and then there are also those that have interests and capacity to contribute to the decision-making. Um, but the intention of the stakeholder perspectives itself is to be inclusive, whoever they are um, and however they can best contribute. Another component, another reservoir of information is or are time space evidence. Um, and this effectively uh, relates to the notion of, of change. Um, the evidence that uh, can be characterized, the natural science is effectively looks at a change across time and space, that these are two objective axes in terms of interpreting change, patterns and trends and so on. So, uh, and then a third type of reservoir are records, governance records, the, the, the authentic actions of governments, uh, different types of authorities from local to international. They relate to agreements. They relate to policy statements by elected or appointed officials. They relate to treaties and conventions, multilateral solutions, but they are the primary sources of information that govern activities. And between these three different reservoirs of information, integrating those various elements reveals options. And so the notion of evidence um, into options, the, the process to generate the options comes from the combination of understanding the stakeholder perspectives and priorities and concerns, and gaps and so on, combined with the time space evidence from the natural sciences as well as the social sciences and indigenous knowledge and the various types of governance records across jurisdictional scales from local to international. It's a complicated process um, revealed simply here in the sense that this process in terms of stakeholder perspectives, time, space, evidence, and governance records is scalable. So on one hand, you can look at this operating within an individual family with parents perhaps or setting the governance records, the time, space, evidence perhaps relates to children doing their chores and stakeholder perspectives would be the entire family, perhaps in-laws and so on and so forth. On an international scale, certainly there are governments, national, there are states, there are non-governmental organizations, intergovernmental organizations, federal agencies, um, and there are different types of, of evidence. They come into international um, evidence from satellites and evidence from observing systems of various flavors. And the governance records are explicit as well. Things like the law of the sea, um, in case of uh, specifically the UN Convention on the law of the sea, but the law of the sea generally in the case of the United States, which 
responds to the law, obviously, is customary international law. Um, there, are other re there are other types of governance solutions, such as the Polar Code, um, transboundary uh, agreements and treaties and conventions, and so on. Um, for definition, as I mentioned earlier, the context of sustainability involves balance, but it also implies stability. And so the challenge that we face is to balance the various interests that exist in ways that contribute to societal well-being, ultimately. Uh, and I would note that this holistic approach, this international interdisciplinary inclusive approach, is intended to operate across generations. Effectively across the 21st century and beyond. And as an epiphany, the notion of the 21st century, the children that are born today will be alive in the 22nd century. So if we think about just the next generation, for all the parents and grandparents alive in the world today, their, their children or grandchildren will be alive in the 22nd century. So there's a personal touch across the 21st century for sure, in the relation to those children or grandchildren. Um, in a sense, the challenge we face collectively on a planetary scale uh, is one of working across a continuum of urgencies, recognizing that there are security timescales, issues, impacts, resources that, that effectively will impact the political, economic, societal, or environmental stability of various governments. And the risks of instability are characterized in terms of security. So those become urgent for governments to respond to. On the other end of the scale, we have sustainability timescales. And sustainability in all flavors, recognizing that the term has become jargon. But in each case, whether it's maximum sustainable yield or sustainable development is framed by Groharlem Brundtland in the 1980s, the concept implies explicitly generations. And so the challenge with sustainability is to think across generations. And so we have a world where we have security issues and because of our global interconnectedness, discussions like climate, symbolize the notion of our planetary perspective um, and the challenge is to grow as a civilization into a into a, into a capacity and that, that we're balancing um, addressing issues across this continuum of urgencies uh, in terms of of science itself so the notion of science and science diplomacy a science in terms of the Pan-Arctic Options and the Arctic Options Project are defined simply as the study of change. So there is discussion frequently in terms of interdisciplinary about breaking down silos. Well, when you break things, there are consequences of breaking things, and it may not be a good idea to break down silos in the first instance because collaborations require capacity, and capacity comes from training people in specific areas. So one solution in terms of interdisciplinary is to think on a broader, more umbrella level. And if science is defined as the study of change, it applies to the natural sciences as well as the social sciences, as well as indigenous knowledge. And so it isn't characterized exactly with the same metrics in each of these different approaches, different methodologies apply, but change is certainly a common feature of the natural sciences, social sciences, and indigenous knowledge. And so on the left, we can see natural sciences in terms of changes in sea ice as reflected by satellites, and satellites giving us coverage of the polar region or planetary, but uh, absent uh, sovereign jurisdictions. So we can effectively map changes on the earth without uh, getting encumbered by uh, sovereignty issues. And so we have a map of looking at the sea ice change of the Arctic, the Pan-Arctic synoptic scale uh, from 1979 to, to the present. Similarly, uh, satellites are being used to collect information about socioeconomic features. And the figure on the right, the histogram, shows changes in shipping in the Arctic. Um, this, I would note, is a unique figure. It's not been published yet. It is based on a data set of over a trillion data points 
collected by the automatic identification system, and as far as I know, is the longest standing record of ship activity in the Arctic region. It's explicitly north of the Arctic Circle from September 1st, 2009 through December 31st, 2016, recognizing that satellite automatic identification system data can be collected into the future as well. What we here have here is an unambiguous baseline of continuous growth in shipping year after year between 2009 and the present. And this unambiguous baseline is based on what's called the mobile maritime service identity, which is tagged to each ship. So each ship is a unique um, type of uh, object. And what we're looking at in this figure is the number of unique objects in the Arctic Ocean from 2009 to the present. And you can see that the number of unique ships operating in the Arctic Ocean has increased consistently uh, over that period. Um, in terms of IARPIC, in terms of thinking forward, and, I, and as I mentioned at the beginning, I had the option, opportunity yesterday to listen to the discussion um, and, and, and think about the carbon case study specifically. Um, however, before that case study was presented from the data, the observing and the modeling perspectives, uh, for me, I didn't see a clear policy relevance of the carbon approach, that it was a scientific activity, that it was being developed for the purposes of science, um, but without any clear societal relevance. Um, so the societal relevance, the action component, and uh, yesterday Emily showed a uh, circular diagram of decision support and uh, action. The action comes from decision making. The decision making uh, will leverage different types of resources, whether they're financial resources or diplomatic capital, um, negotiations, whatever it happens to be, uh, the decision making uh, is a component. And that's where the action is. Um, so in terms of the case studies, not only as a suggestion, as an option, again, to be used or ignored, recognizing that I'm talking to federal agencies, the United States government, the option is to use or ignore these options here. And the uh, second option is to engage decision-making frameworks that relate to both the built elements and governance mechanisms. That means that not only is there a need to work with the decision makers in government, but there's a need to work with the decision makers who are gonna be allocating technical or financial resources. That means industry. And as I could see from the discussion yesterday, one of the missing elements in terms of carbon was there was no social industry relevance or relationship yet to the types of research that would be conducted. Um, third is that the case study should integrate the natural and social sciences um, as well as indigenous knowledge. And so in a sense, carbon in terms of uh, different pools of carbon, currency of carbon, as was discussed, um, isn't clearly related to both the natural and social sciences as well as indigenous knowledge. However, having listened to the presentations yesterday, there's no question in my mind that carbon itself is a very clever uh, uh, focus for environmental intelligence. And I think if, if constructed correctly, um, this environmental intelligence activity through IARPIC has the potential to be transformational. Um, so when we think in terms of carbon in the Arctic, most of the time the world thinks in terms of oil and gas, for example. Well, we have permafrost that's being considered by the natural sciences. The amount of permafrost has been estimated, or the amount of methane in the permafrost that has been estimated to be something on the order of half the global atmospheric constant mm -hmm. volume of, of methane coming from the Arctic potentially. And so one question, for example, could be uh, the amount of, of methane being captured in the terms of liquid nat natural gas versus the amount of methane that's uh, devolving directly from the permafrost itself. Um, there is also other types of carbon that are clearly related to decision-making, for example, black carbon from shipping, uh, 
um, certainly lends itself to modeling um, impacts that integrate atmospheric and ocean uh, business all at the same time, clear policy relevance. And so in terms of, of the case study, uh, it would be helpful to identify, think about the natural and social sciences as well as the indigenous knowledge elements and how they're integrated. Um, the case study itself on a, on a, on a very basic level um, for Arctic sustainability to mature and sustainable development was identified by all of the Arctic states and in six indigenous peoples organizations in 1996 under the Ottawa Declaration that established the Arctic Council, uh, sustainable development was identified as a common Arctic issue. Um, so in a very basic sense, that common Arctic issue requires that uh, sustainability uh, be operational over time. And to facilitate that, there needs to be coordination, cooperation, and consistency on a pan-Arctic scale among the various types of decisions that are being made. We see this emerging in terms of governance discussions and from 2009 to the present. Uh, there has been a, a change in the, in the framing of the Arctic Council, for example. The Arctic Council uh, 2011 led to the agreement on uh, search and rescue. In 2013 led to the agreement on marine pollution preparedness and response. And in 2017 led to the science, enhancing scientific cooperation agreement. Um, those are clear contributions uh, from a scientific process you know, from the Arctic Council in terms of the research and assessment activities from the working groups percolating through the senior Arctic officials up to the ministers when they sign the declarations and ultimately the agreements. Um, so whatever IARPIC pursuit produces in terms of the case study, it would be helpful to think in terms of how that case study contributes to cooperation, coordination, and consistency on a pan-Arctic scale over generations. Um, and certainly, in terms of a practical sense, since this is a U.S. government activity, um, it would be prudent, I would think, to build on broad interests that exist across the agencies. Carbon clearly been identified as such, and existing strengths, um, and how those existing strengths um, can be leveraged. So. One of the elements, uh, for example, is there's a great deal of focus on the ocean um, and uh, traffic in the ocean. Those are strengths within a number of different agencies. There's a certainly security elements to the movement of ships in the ocean, as well as sustainability issues in terms of long-term impacts and the types of infrastructure that will need to be developed for safe shipping in the Arctic Ocean. And they all relate to carbon. So in a sense, carbon as the umbrella concept uh, would benefit from understanding the subsets of, of activities, impacts, and resources that would fit into that, that uh, discussion. I might introduce just in terms of, of um, uh, uh, this as an illustration of how of, of panoramic options and thinking about issues, impacts, and resources, uh, specifically in the ocean. We see that the ocean effectively is a new Arctic Ocean. Um, if you think about a system, any system is defined by its boundaries. Um, the Arctic Ocean as a system historically had a multi-year sea ice covering it across the region beyond the yellow in this picture. Um, and then during the period of satellite observations, amazingly, coincidentally, but amazingly nonetheless, uh, the sea ice changed. And the sea ice changed to about half the extent of the Arctic in terms of the aerial extent. And the, it's a much larger number. We think about it in terms of the volume of sea ice because most of the multi-year sea ice in the Arctic is gone. It's now multi, mostly first and near second year ice. Um, if we think about it, a system, it's like a room um, and the room has a floor, it has walls, it has a ceiling. Um, and if, I, if the room ceiling, the room is removed, everybody in that room uh, will move around differently. And the system, it's because the system itself is no longer the same system because I've fundamentally changed one of the boundaries. 
I look at the Arctic Ocean, because the sea ice as a surface boundary of the ocean has changed, it changes the fusion of, uh, of gases into the ocean, out of the gap, um, that affect uh, acidification and so on. It, it affects the fetches that, that relate to erosion in the coastal areas. It changes the migration and development habits of species in the ocean. It affects the ability to move goods, uh, services across the ocean. Yeah. So in effect, we have a new Arctic Ocean and the, the risks of change in the Arctic are not, in, are not projected. They are inherent consequences of a new system, a system with a, with a different boundary. And so in this context, I was, the Pan-Arctic Options Project has been looking at shipping specifically um, as, a, as a major element. And this focus on shipping and sea ice um, emerged from workshops uh, that were convened with, with uh, U.S. government officials, state officials in Alaska, um, indigenous peoples, uh, native organizations from Alaska, uh, universities, you know, industry, um, in a sense, a diverse group of stakeholders intending to be inclusive. And out of that two uh, major drivers of concern were identified in these coastal communities and one is sea ice and the other is shipping. So we have a biophysical component and we have a natural component uh, in terms of the impact. The figure on the left shows that we can take this information and we can plot it um, down to effectively the individual ships. So the, the, the large data set that exists in terms of the automatic identification systems yeah, allows all kinds of scales to be interpreted, questions to be asked. So one question, for example, is what is the shipping look like in the Barents Sea region, which is historically open water, versus the Bering Strait region, uh, which is an important uh, choke point uh, in terms of the Arctic Ocean itself. We can see that in both regions, whether it's the Barents Sea or the Bering Strait, that shipping is increasing. And so the, the, the first figure I showed was sea ice and shipping. You might make the assumption that, that the, the shipping is increasing because sea ice is decreasing. And so one way of testing that is to look at the Barents Sea region and to assess changes in an area that is historically open water year round. So the shipping in the Barents, increase in shipping in the Barents Sea region is clearly not only related to sea ice um, because it's an open water area. For example, we can look at all kinds of other data from the, the that are associated with the automatic identification system. We can look at the metadata contained in each of these um, AIS packets of information from satellites. They contain the, the countries, the number of ships uh, from the various nations over time. Um, we can look at the size of the ships. We can look at the, the cargo of the ships. We can look at the types of the ships. We can look at destinations of the ship. So there's a rich suite of metadata to be able to address. And certainly all of this um, can be put into the context of carbon, particularly in areas and things like black carbon, potential risks from pollution events and so on. Um, it also, the data sets also allow us to look at movements of individual ships. And here is a set of profiles of research vessels from several different nations and where they've moved over time. So we can use this to, for example, forecast where ships have been in distress. We can use that to determine whether there are characteristics of ship that's in distress that might be able to be used for modeling that, um, those characteristics in, in terms of emergency response. Um, and so how do we implement things like the search and rescue agreement, the Marine Pollution Preparedness and Response Agreement? Certainly one element in the Arctic Ocean is to use the automatic identification system. It is unique in terms of its capacity to interpret ship maritime traffic um, in the ocean. Um, number of regulatory vessels per area in relation to types of other vessels. What are the risks with having limited um, uh, response capacity? So there are all kinds of those types of questions to ask. And in the case of the Arctic Ocean, there's a very clear 
jurisdictional framework, um, regulatory governance record that can be used, applied, for example, the law of the sea, the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea ranges from the baseline, the terrestrial area, through a territorial sea uh, into a contiguous zone, and then beyond that, the exclusive economic zone. Effectively, those are areas that are that have touches to nations and sovereign jurisdictions. However, beyond exclusive economic zone in the water is the high seas, and the high seas is explicitly an area of, of an international space. And similarly, on the sea floor, beyond the continental shelf is the area, the deep sea, and that is also an area beyond sovereign jurisdiction. And so in a sense, from the baseline, the, the, the nation state, the, the terrestrial area, we have a continuum of jurisdictions from the nation state into the international space, effectively transitioning from national interests to common interests. So in a very practical sense, the Arctic Ocean itself is a case study for how we will manage the earth on a planetary scale in terms of balancing national interests and common interests. Um, I would note that the Arctic Seafloor is a different jurisdictional zone than the overlying water column. So the high seas explicitly is beyond sovereign jurisdictions and unambiguously it will not change um, with any decisions about outer continental shelves under the Law of the Sea Convention Article 76. Um, so in a sense, this type of approach where there are activities and uh, impacts that are being uh, addressed by the case study through the environmental act, intelligence activity of, of IARPIC um, would benefit from understanding explicitly what the governance records are. Um, in this case, it was just being used to illustrate that maritime activities uh, directly relate to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. They also relate to the IMO polar code, they relate to an, polar bears and other other types of, 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 of um, agreements. I also would note that the international dimensions in the Arctic uh, exist in the ocean, not in land. The land areas fall explicitly within national jurisdictions. And so if a component of the study uh, is to focus on the international dimensions of, of uh, the carbon in the Arctic, uh, then it's absolutely necessary to consider the marine elements of that because the, the ocean is where the, and the atmosphere are where there are transboundary impacts. Things that happen within the boundaries of nations on land are sovereign jurisdictions and sovereign decisions. Um, so the intention here is to be helpful. Um, I've tried to share some of the perspectives that learning that has gone on with the Arctic Options and Pan-Arctic Options projects. It's a, it's a work in progress. Um, feel fortunate to be able to share this with colleagues and friends involved with IARPIC and uh, hope this presentation was helpful. Thank you very much.